Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig, an inquiry into values. Huge on Goodreads, what, a couple of hundred thousand on ter- in terms of Goodreads, better what, a 40-year-old book. Uh, I heard a story it was turned down by 121 publishers before it finally got the green light to be published and clearly it paid off because he sold... Millions of copies. Millions of copies, an absolute cult classic. A lot of people out there, this is their favorite book out of all the books. And what it's about is of a middle-aged man and his son, Chris, who are going on a motorcycle trip accompanied by another adult couple. They go on a journey from Minnesota to California. They're not just taking the highways, they're taking the back roads. They're sleeping overnight in motels or they're camping out in the open. The man describes what it's like to hear the wind moving across the plains, to see birds rise up from the marshes next to the road, to ride through a ferocious storm and to breathe the fresh air of a mountain above the tree line. Now, the motorcycle rider, he's got an interesting backstory because there was a time in his life when he was thrown into a mental asylum. He suffered a mental breakdown at mid-career because society thought he was insane. He was taken to hospital, zapped with electrodes, and he'd come out a different person who is the motorcycle person today. And as they go on the motorcycle ride, we learn through fragments of memory of the philosopher he once was. And this name of this alter ego is Phaedrus. And there's interesting parts of this philosophy of Phaedrus that come out through the book, through things that he's termed shatterquas. Call him Rob. We we'll assume that Rob, the author of the book, is probably talking about himself in a in a deep, dark sort of a way. But Chris and Rob, they were traveling down uh, Montana. They had their friends riding ahead. Their plans were deliberately indefinite. It was more to travel than to arrive. Secondary roads were preferred. and They wanted to make good time to get to their destination, but the focus was on good, not on time. When you make the shift in emphasis here, the whole world changes. And when you're on this motorcycle as you're driving along, you don't really make conversations with your son who's sitting on the back. Instead, you kind of spend your time being aware of the things and meditating on them. You meditate on the sights and the sounds and the mood of the weather and all the things that have been remembered in your life back in the day. So we're told these stories through a series of Chautauquas. Now, Chautauqua, uh, for anyone in Oz, maybe what, eight to 10 years ago, it was a, it was a horse um, <laughs> that I bet on a couple of times. Uh, won a couple of times, but lost more often than not. It was a great horse. It should have won more than it did, but there was two times where the <laughs> gates opened and it didn't jump out. It didn't run. It didn't run the race, so I lost that bet. Anyway, that's I don't know if Chautauqua was named after this or something else, but we're going to go with Chautauqua as these, these sort of stories that the narrator tells throughout the, the book as a sort of an abstract way of trying to deliver a few ideas. It's probably an area of thought you could only get when you're really deep and so pensive on something like a motorcycle. Because as he's driving along, things that come to mind are quite different to all of us when we're so busy in our lives and always in a hurry, and we never really get the chance to have this conversation with ourselves. Yeah, we're in this endless day-to-day shallowness, the monotony, the things that we're doing that we think are important that we just have to get done, leaves us on the surface level. We never really get that time to just sit on a motorbike, drive for a long time, not specifically to drive anywhere, but just to sit there. So the first Chateauqua presented in the book is through the two different ways that we can view the world, whether it be romantic or classic. Now, firstly, the classic understanding sees the world primarily as underlying form itself, and a romantic understanding sees it primarily in terms of its immediate appearance. So let's say if you would go to show an engine or a mechanical drawing on an electronic schematic or a structural drawing to a romantic, she's unlikely going to get a lot of interest out of it. For her, there's no appeal in it because reality, there's more to it than this bloody little drawing. All it is is dull and complex, a list of names, lines and numbers, and there's nothing really interesting to see here. But if you show this same blueprint or schematic and you give the same description to a classic person, she might look at it and become fascinated by it because she sees the lines and the shapes, she sees the symbols, she sees a tremendous richness, and she sees how all these different parts work together to form something bigger. Now, the other mode of life is romantic, which is somewhat inspirational. This is imaginative, creative, intuitive, and it's all about feelings rather than facts. We're talking a bit more like art here as opposed to science, and it's not governed by reason or laws. It's all about feeling intuition and aesthetic conscience. To a romantic, the classic mode often appears dull, awkward, ugly. It's like mechanical maintenance itself. Everything in terms of its pieces and parts and components and relationships, nothing is figured out until it is run through 
the computer a dozen times. The classic is trying to get so nitty-gritty and so analytical that they miss the bigger picture. Yeah, but those who are classics, who are analytical, they look at the romantics as they're just irrational, erratic, untrustworthy. I could imagine getting a whole group of engineers, some of my peers, and taking them out there to go and see some contemporary art forms. So I think that's probably a a modern example of where the split might be. They go there, they sit in the crowd and go, why the hell is she moving around and jumping around to this weird music? And uh, there's this really romantic mode of art where uh, ballet last year, I'll tell you about the one where um, really contemporary, where a bloke literally shits on stage. Oh my God, no. Yeah, Corey was telling me about that. But um, you can imagine a bunch of... (laughs) It would be what? pretty hard to do, man, to time it. Because like, you only get, what, one, maybe two shits a day. You'd have to really work mate, on I'm the not, system to get it at I, that time. I'm not kidding. It's a, it's a, in. What, you watch him shit on the stage? Does some weird that's shit. That's not art, man. Stuff. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> well, mate, maybe that's uh, weirdest, weirdest classic. Maybe we're so classy that we're not seeing the romantic side of, of taking a dump in front of 100 people. Yeah, I think it's pretty pretty gross. <laughs> I think we get the point that some people don't really just get it when they see art. And, <laughs> A lot of the time, they'll be uh, in the classic mode. Oh, man. I think I'm obviously so classic, but I can understand the romantic person being like, mate, you just don't get it. It's art. <laughs> but I don't think they oh, get mate, it either, if man. If me and you were on stage there, we'd be, we'd be calling bullshit, <laughs> quite literally. Quite literally, mate, quite literally. So both types, a lot of the time, they really don't understand each other. And even in recent times, there's been a huge split in classic culture and romantic subculture. I think put our example aside because there's a lot of other examples we can draw from there, I think. But the two worlds are growing alienated and somewhat hateful towards each other. Yeah, the romantics see the classics as dull and boring. The classics see the romantics as a parasite or a drag on society. That they're really like it's a house divided against itself. The two worlds are growing more alienated and they're really splitting apart. In one sense, us trying to split the world into these two categories has somewhat of its own disadvantages as well. And this is the second shot acquire of the book. And this is all about the application of Phaedrus's knife. The division of worlds into parts is something that everybody does. You know, all the time there are a million things going on around us that we can't possibly be consciously aware of everything. So we just choose what we direct our awareness towards to. There are things happening all the time. Say you're riding on your motorcycle from Montana to California. There's so many things that you could be aware of. You could be aware of the birds flying around you. You could be aware of the wind in the trees. You could be aware of the rocks on the road. Or you can turn your awareness to the motorcycle itself and think about the throttle and how hard you're you're pulling it backwards and how fast you're going. Uh, there's an endless... That's only like six things. There's like mm. an endless amount of things going on around you that you could possibly be aware of, but you're not. Yeah, there's almost this infinite complexity that goes through our perceptive filters and we call this perceptive filters our reality. In one sense, when it goes through these filters, it's like we're taking this handful of sand from the endless landscape of awareness around us and what we're doing is we're calling this tiny little bit of sand that's in our hand, we're describing that this is the world. Yeah, you're standing in the middle of the Sahara Desert Endless to the horizons all around you. You pick up a handful of sand and say, this is the desert. This is the entire world. But what we're doing here, this is what he calls Phaedrus's knife. We're slicing this knife through. We're dividing the sand into its parts. You know, we've got this and that, here and there, black and white, now and then. The discrimination is the division of the conscious universe into its parts. But whenever we try to use this knife to slice apart sections and differentiate different things, something is killed in the process. I think in one sense, we apply this knife when it comes to articulation of all sorts of language because as you grow older as a young pup making your way (laughs) through the world and you learn the word, let's say the moon. Now, something like the moon, it's so bizarre and strange if you put the definition aside. You look at it, it's just just bizarre. There's just a thing floating around in the air. and uh, But as soon as you just say, hey, it's the moon, all of a sudden you reduce all the wildness of what it actually is into this one definitional word and then all of a sudden it loses a lot of its beauty and this is where we're applying the knife of Phaedrus and something is killed in the process of this rational thought. Yeah, when you split apart the art versus the science or the romantic versus the classic or the rational versus the emotional, the more you learn about the moon, 
probably the more boring it becomes as well, yeah? As you say, when you first look up and you see this weird thing floating in the sky, sometimes it's a circle, sometimes it's a semicircle, sometimes it's just a little, little tiny crescent and you're just thinking, what the hell is going on up there? Mm. And then uh, obviously then you learn about it, you learn about planets, you learn about the solar system, you learn about how it's just a big rock floating in space and you learn about the different intricacies of the moon. The more you learn that rational side of it, the less curious, I guess, you become about the moon. Well, if you play with a toddler or a baby, like which I've, uh, my niece, she's what, three years old, I think now, three or four, um, go to the farm with her and the cow. She's so excited about cows. Um, they're insane. She runs out and it's always the most exciting part of the day. But to us adults, perhaps arguably smarter, maybe not, to us it's just a cow. It's just a black and white thing that we've defined. It's grass and shits. <laughs> it's grass and shits and that's it. But uh, you know, maybe we're not the necessarily the smart ones uh, in this sense because perhaps she's the one appreciating what a cow really is a bit more than us. Yeah, she's taking on that that full essence of the cow, whereas we've just taken Phaedrus's knife and 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 tried to chop it up, and uh, something got killed. Mm. It might have been the cow. <laughs> <laughs> As we flagged at the start of the episode, Phaedrus he went insane. Society thought he went insane. We know that he was a knower of logic. It wasn't necessarily like a uh, machine with systematic thought. It was a lot more like the laser beam that was so sharp and so focused that he could illuminate what he thought was everything. He even applied this laser beam to breaking the world into classic and romantic understandings. And it was also one of the, the, the reasons for his downfall. We're driving along. We got Chris in the back. We got our friends ahead of us. But the road has come up to all the pine trees again, but it's not going to last forever. Looking to the left as we're driving, there is some resort billboards and some kids beneath them playing along. It's almost looking a little bit like it's part of the advertisement because they're just gathering pine cones. It looks like quite a picturesque photo here. They wave at us, and in doing so, this little boy drops his cones. As we're driving along, our thought goes to our next Chautauqua. If all of human knowledge, everything that's known, is believed to be a hierarchical structure, then the high country of the mind is found at the uppermost reaches of this structure, in the most general and abstract considerations of all, and very few people ever travel there. When you're in this high land, this area of just complete abstraction, in one sense, there's no real profit to hang out and wander through here. But in one sense, a bit like the high country we're driving through at the moment, it's got its own austere beauty that for some people, it makes it worth all the hard work traveling to get up there. In the high country of the physical world, the air up there is a lot thinner. And in the high country of the mind, it's also a lot thinner as well. The air is thinner because of uncertainty due to the enormous magnitude of the questions asked and the answers proposed to those questions as well. A lot of us just feel very uncomfortable when uh, the uncertainty, just not knowing things and just sitting in that and the uncertainty that comes with it. A lot of us probably feel like we're just holding this handful of sand and just assuming that's all there is because when we're sitting there not knowing, we're allowing ourselves to be overwhelmed by some of the over complexity that actually is in part of the universe. I think reading this book felt like getting to the high country of the mind. I was very uncomfortable of not knowing what the hell was going on. <laughs> But there are so many questions out there. You know, what is the truth and how do we know when you have it? How do we really know anything? Is there an I which, uh, which knows? Or is the soul merely cells coordinating senses? Is reality basically changing or is it always fixed and permanent? When it's said that something means something, what does that even mean? <laughs> well, a lot those, of questions up in this high country of the mind. Well, it is uncomfortable because there's something, they're so profound and wild and something that we probably just don't like sitting in that, that area. Uh, it's too th- too thin the air up there. Yeah, I think there's, again, there's probably no definitive answer. Here. There's there's sort of two arguments or two sides to every story. Like some people can argue that there's really been no progress, that, that a civilization that kills multitudes in mass warfare, that pollutes lands and oceans, that destroys the dignity of individuals by subjecting them to a forced mechanized existence can hardly be called an advanced society over what we might refer to as a simpler hunter-gatherer or agricultural existence of prehistoric times. On the other hand, romantics and part of us or part of ourselves kind of romanticize what it was for the prehistoric hunter-gatherer societies. We think they were just being present, one with the earth and nature and didn't have this mechanized existence that we have in the modern world. But in one sense, these ancient wars back in the day with the hunter-gatherers, They'd go to war with much less justification than we do today. 
and our schoolbook pictures of what they went through, the pain, the disease, the famine, the hard labor that was necessary to stay alive, we kind of just neglect that in our romantic view of them. Because there has been somewhat of an upward trajectory from the pain of the agony of just bare existence to what we have in our modern life today with our air conditioning on. Here's a line for you, Jonesy. To some extent, the romantic condemnation of rationality stems from the very effectiveness of rationality in uplifting humans from primitive conditions. It's one hell of a quote up here in the high country, though, isn't it? <laughs> but it's such a... It's, so we're going to do Stephen Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, which is really about the case for reason and how much better we have improved in society. But in one sense, what they're saying here, it's become such a powerful, all-dominating agent of civilized man, right? This hunt for reason and improving things. But when we do, we're shutting everything else out and it's now dominating us ourselves. And this is what the source of the complaint is. The romantics are saying we're so obsessed and dominated by this that, again, we're losing something in the process of improving things through reason. So, old Chris and Rob up in the high country here, they actually pull over to the side of the road, they park their motorcycle and decide to climb up a mountain. And uh, Rob says that mountains, they should be climbed with as little effort as possible and really without desire. The reality of our own nature should determine the speed. If you become restless, then you speed up a little. If you become a bit gassed, a bit winded, then you slow down a bit. And climbing the mountain should be an equilibrium between this restlessness and exhaustion. As you're trudging your way up the mountain, there's a few things you start to notice. A lot of the life starts to vanish the higher you go up. It turns out that it's the size of the mountains on the way up which actually sustain life and not the top. And that's really where the things grow. Yeah, each footstep is no longer just a step towards the ultimate destination, but each footstep is an event in itself. You see the little bits of life along the way. You see the leaf that has the jagged edges or the funny colored rock. Each footstep along this journey that you're traveling isn't just getting you towards the destination, but it is part of the journey itself. So much like our Shadow Choir on the ideas of abstraction, perhaps this isn't the place that sustains life. But on the other sense, you need the top if you don't have the top, then you don't have the sides. And it's the top that actually defines where the sides are. Chris and Rob, they ride down out of this mountain that they, they were climbing now and they, they ride through this small green plain. Immediately to the left, they can see pine forested mountains that they just come from. They can see the last of winter's snow up on the top. And in all directions appear lower mountains, it's like a picture postcard scenery and the statement to travel is better than to arrive comes back to mind. And this brings us to the next big old horsey Chautauqua. Which is the all about the hunt for quality. So what, what is quality in the world? What the hell is it? How can we define what it is? In one sense, one way we can find out is pull out the old Phaedrus steak knife <laughs> um, and reduce the world. And then in doing that, we can see what functions abnormally without quality and the difference after we apply the knife might define actually what mm. what quality is and how it exists. So we said a couple of shiitakas ago that when you slice a knife through and try to split and differentiate things, something dies. And in this case, the first casualty when you're trying to separate things to try to find quality, the first thing that dies is going to be fine arts. If you can't distinguish between good or bad in the arts, they're going to disappear. Because there's no point hanging a painting on the wall if it's no better than just the bare wall itself. There's no point listening to symphonies when just the scratches or the hums of the record player sound just as good as the record itself. Poetry would disappear since it doesn't really make any sense anymore and it's got no practical value. Interestingly, comedy probably disappears because no one really understands the jokes. Next would be the sports. Like, What's the point if someone is swinging around on a bar in, in, in gymnastics? So... No point really having the Olympics or well, the people who just kick a ball off the ground and it goes through the net. I mean, it's just a ball flying in the air. Like, what's the point of that? So you get rid of soccer, you get rid of AFL footy, just kicking a ball around and tackling and hugging each other. It all just seems pretty pointless. The next thing that dies is going to be the marketplace. Things like, like foods, if there's no differentiation between flavors, if there's no quality anymore in food, then you're just going to get the basic sustenance. You're not going to bother to get the expensive, fancy foods. There are parts of the world that would not really be affected as we apply this knife. And that, of course, would be the things that are purely intellectual pursuits. 
So applied science and technology, that would be changed, but pure science would remain unchanged. So engineering, law, things math related, that would hang around, which is kind of odd because like, why would that be? Well, the world can function without quality. So he's saying that once you've reduced all this quality out, the world can still function. But life in this qualityless world would be so dull that it'd be hardly worth living. There's a number of social situations that we got in history where applied the knife who defined some utopia, some purely rational way of the world should be. But what when they applied the knife to what their view of what the rational way the world should be, some things were kind of lost in this process. You think about civilizations like ancient Sparta, communist Russia, communist China, and of course, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and 1984 by George Orwell. They built up this utopia. They defined what quality should be. They worked towards this rational, logical goal. But of course, in doing so, it actually turned it into more of a dystopia. Yes, you're living in a world where everything's governed through the laws of reason and, and reason alone, but it's somewhat dull and mechanical. And so as we're driving along, old Robbie here, he's, he's trying to create this vision of a world without quality keep squinting at this vision of a qualityless world, trying to conjure up more and more details, what things are going to change, what things aren't going to change. And the more he should talk was his way through this, he finally circles back to where he was before and he's created this new term called squareness. On the square side, we have what every intellectual analysis looks for and probably me and you, Ash, as we're reading this book and something we probably hard to, it's hard for us to avoid. And that's taking the analytical knife and putting it directly towards this term of quality and just tapping the knife here. A little tiny tap. A little tiny tap, not hard, but gently in the whole world, it's splitting into <laughs> two. We've got our hip and square. We're saying, all right, that's classic. That's romantic. That person's technological. That's humanistic. That's yin. That's yang. And when we're doing it with this split, it's clean. There's no mess. There's no slop. There's no uncertainty. And Phaedrus, he came up with an interesting understanding of the world and perhaps this was kind of what his intellectual suicide um, was confined upon. Squareness may be succinctly and yet thoroughly defined as an inability to see quality before it's been intellectually defined. That is, before it gets all chopped up into words. So it's our inability to just let quality be something that's undefined is that definition of why well, we might be square in this circumstance. <laughs> So quality, it's something that precedes this definition of putting things into these rational boxes that we're predisposed to do. The road ahead of us has twisted and rolled over desert hills into a little narrow thread of green surrounding a town called Whitebird. Then proceeding onto a big, fast river flowing between high canyon walls. Here, it's pretty hot here. The heat is tremendous and the glare from the White Canyon rock, it's blinding us as we're driving along. The wind on through the bottom of the narrow canyon were nervous about moving through fast traffic oppressed by the fire heat. And pensively riding deep in thought, we land on our next Chautauqua, which is all about quality in the context of work. At the simple level, you've got sharpening a kitchen knife or sewing a dress or mending a broken chair. In each of those cases, there's a beautiful way of doing it and an ugly way of doing it. And in arriving at the high quality, beautiful way of doing it, both an ability to see what looks good and an ability to understand the underlying methods to arrive at that good are needed. So you need both the classic and the romantic understandings of what quality must be. The nature in our culture is such that if you were to look for an instruction manual on how to do any of these jobs, the instruction is going to give you one way of doing it and one understanding of quality and, of course, only the classic understanding. It will tell you to hold the blade like this, sharpen the knife, or this is how you use the sewing machine, or this is the type of glue and how to apply it, with the presumption that if you just follow these methods and applying them, goods are just naturally going to follow along. And that's typically the result of you know modern technology. There's an overall dullness, a mechanical nature. Uh, the appearance is kind of depressing, so you've got to try to add something over the top, some kind of veneer, some kind of style to make it acceptable. So it's sort of like you go the classic mode, you do it, buy the book, step by step, follow the recipe, and then at the very end, you just sprinkle a little bit of romantic on top of it to uh, to make it try to look quality. Yeah, and to anyone who is sensitive to romantic quality, the one who's just got this only a classical sense, the romantic person, it just makes it much worse for them. 
I made another mistake like this during the week when I was doing a presentation to a bunch of architects on how to design the cross-laminated timber buildings, which is the industry I'm in. And uh, I went through the three rules. I said, um, you know, no transfer structures. You need your squares, so no no interesting shapes. Just have a square thing. So it's the most efficient at transferring the loads and avoiding complexity so everything can be manufactured and installed properly. And all of these make a lot of sense from a classic point of view. But in hindsight, after reading this, the romantics in the room would be like, all right, this square is mm. just applying the knife to what design really is. And he's removing our, <laughs> our whole profession essentially. Similarly, for me in marketing, in digital marketing, you've got a brief a designer of how to make an ad. And you just think, okay, well, here's the things that you need. You need a, you need a good headline. You know, you need a good call to action. So just like go and make something that's got a catchy headline, a good call to action. But of course, the designer with a more romantic view of what good and what quality is, just by following those instructions, you're not going to get to a quality, beautiful looking design. Mm. Probably for both of us and probably all of our audience listening right now, we all love our non-fiction books out there. And both of us especially rag on fiction books. But and out of reading, I'd say... The romantic books are probably on the fiction where it's a bit more in the high ground, the high country and a bit more abstract. Whereas when we're just reading purely non-fiction, maybe we're missing something in terms of quality when it comes to what books can offer. So we can't we can't just manufacture quality by making our classic version, the grey, dull, lifeless version, then just like adding some tinsel around a Christmas tree on top of it to add the romantic nature. The romantic side needs to come along for the whole ride. And the fuel that really drives this process of creating something of quality is what he calls gumption. And it's a fuel that can take us to do all sorts of different things. Let's say you've got your your cousin and uh, he spent his weekend going on this long, quiet fishing trip to you, it might be, oh, geez, why the hell would you waste your time? Um, and they might feel like they need to get defensive for putting so much time away for something that just got no account. There's no intellectual justification of what they've been doing. But what they've come back with, the fishermen, there's usually this peculiar abundance of this term he's coined gumption. In his sense, he has been wasting his time. It's only a limited culture viewpoint that makes it seem that it's been a waste of time. So if you're going to repair a motorcycle, do a bit of motorcycle maintenance, then you need a fair supply of gumption. And he says that actually gumption is probably the first and foremost, the most important tool of this whole process. Your other tools, your spanners, your screwdrivers, what other, I don't even know what other tools <laughs> there are out there. But the other tools are meaningless unless you've got that key tool, which is gumption. It's the psychic gasoline that keeps the whole thing going. If you haven't got it, there is no way that the motorcycle can be fixed. But if you do have it and you know how to keep it, there's no way in the world the motorcycle can keep itself from getting fixed. It's bound to happen and it's bound to get fixed up. Therefore, the thing that must be monitored at all times and preserved before anything else in motorcycle maintenance is gumption. So gumption is that missing piece of the puzzle, the thing that's missing from any manual that gives you the step-by-step instructions of how to actually maintain and fix your motorcycle. You've got the logical, the classical side of it, but they don't ever tell you that gumption is that key relationship. And it's really, it's probably just as intricate as the relationship of the different uh, component parts of the motorcycle, how they relate to each other. This gumption relationship from the mechanic to the machine is just as important, if not more so. Yeah, and this is something we can take our time to understand because gumption is a little bit like the energy and enthusiasm that you have towards the task and this is the, the romantic side of the thing that's going to bring quality into the whole process. But there are some things that kind of suck the gumption out of what you're doing and take it away and uh, undermine the, the, the hunt for quality in whatever work you're trying to do. And these are the little things that come up. The low quality things are from a dusted knuckle to an accidentally irreplaceable assembly the tires flat, the steering wheel stopped turning. Have you ever ridden a motorcycle? There's no, there's no steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, there you go, mate. I'm not. A, it's not. Oh, I don't have gumption in this context, do I? Not at all. Not at all. But you can just imagine if you're if you're trying to fix this motorcycle and the chain breaks and you got to wait four days for them to send a new chain and really that's a real big gumption suck or a gumption trap as he calls it. Or if you think about say. Uh, 
an artist who gets commissioned to do a work and then they have to do the admin side of it and they have to either do the client relations or have to send off their invoice. These things that pull them away from doing their actual work, they can be gumption traps which, which sap a little bit of the excitement and the enthusiasm out of the task. Yeah, things that get frustrating, angering, infuriating. In a sense, that's kind of what it makes it interesting. But at the same time, it is a big gumption trap. And what is a supplier of gumption in for some is not for others. Like for us, podcast editing, um, luckily that was a bit of a trap for us. Mm. And we found someone, Jan, who's an absolute superstar at editing everything we do. Um, and for her, it's not a, she has gumption towards the editing, whereas for us, it's actually a trap for the overall context of podcasting. So this thing we're calling gumption, it's not a fixed commodity. It's a variable. It's a reservoir of good spirits that can be added to or subtracted from. So as we said, maybe you go on that fishing trip and just take a bit of a spell for a couple of days. That can refill your gumption reservoirs or when you're fixing your motorcycle and the steering wheel falls off, then that's uh, that's really going to sap, sap your gumption. Yeah, you don't want that steering wheel to fall <laughs> off, do you? Of all the gumption traps that are around the world, there's millions of them. There's little intricate ones in every task, whatever you might be doing. But the worst of all is value rigidity. And this is the inability to revalue what you see because of your commitment to previous values. So let's say you're doing your motorcycle maintenance and in this context, what you need to do is rediscover everything as you go. Everything needs to be fresh and you're coming in with an empty cup. But if you've got these rigid values based on what you previously thought, this is going to make it impossible and be sucking all the gumption out. If we think about our own sort of reading journeys and learning journeys, if we weren't opening to revalue what we previously valued, if we were too committed to our previous views, it's pretty hard to learn new things because we would just think the first book that we read had all the answers and we just follow that to the letter of the law and that's that. But actually, by reading more and more and by being open to learning more and more and be having the ability to revalue some of those things, we probably change our minds. Something that we thought was definitely true, we're now questioning. Something that we thought was way off track, we're actually thinking, oh, actually, maybe that had some merit to it. And by revisiting some of your old beliefs, it can actually fuel your gumption rather than just being so rigidly trapped in what you value and what you don't. Yeah, whatever you thought was a quality book going um, through the reading journey, if you get fixed on that idea of quality, then you you got a, probably an expiration date on how many books you're going to read. But if it's always continually updating, then you're never going to end um, and you potentially will never lose and rid yourself of gumption. No, I've got, I had reading this book, I had zero gumption. I gave mm. up halfway through and I was like, how, Jonesy, how the hell are you going to turn this into an episode? I couldn't even <laughs> see where it was going. But now... Whatever you've pulled out, I don't know how you did it because I wasn't reading the same book clearly. <laughs> but now I'm like, actually, maybe there's a bit to this. There's a bit is. Of, it's refueling my gumption to consider maybe finishing off the second half of the book. Yeah, well, when we uh, spoke in, in setting it up, if uh, we see it as something that is a bit more of a slap in the face for both of us, then we might, uh, which I think we've got a bit of gumption in that context Yeah. when it comes to reading. That's half the reason you're reading. And this really does pull apart the attitude that the classical understanding of the world is all that exists. And it's interesting, he says here that often if you make a mistake, you know, if something goes wrong that would normally be a gumption trap, you think that the way to fix it is to speed up, to do things quicker and quicker and quicker, but actually that's going to make it worse and worse. You're going to make more mistakes as you go. He said you actually have to slow down. So I think I, I was like, oh man, I'm hating this book. I'm going to read it quicker. I'm going to power through it. And then I'm going to read the book summaries. The quicker I went, the less I understood it. <laughs> Whereas he was saying, actually, that's a trap in itself. You've got to actually slow down and deliberately just look at the thing as it is rather than trying to force the meaning onto it. As we wrap it up, what we're starting to realize is that Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, this book is telling us that we won't get to the truth about life through pursuing answers through only the rational mind. So Rob, as he was both Rob and Phaedrus, the same person, he originally hungered for a rational explanation for everything. But in the end, he found that both science and philosophy, they're just maps of the truth. But in other areas like love of another person or experience in nature or a feeling of closeness to God, we can access truths that actually can't be broken down. It kind of makes you think about the technical culture we live in and try to find room where we can have this quality for things 
that are of a more abstract nature. And it shows that if we try to be too analytical and try to be too in that classical mode of thinking, it shows that a life drained of quality and with no gumption isn't really a life worth living. Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance and Rob, the author, he's not saying reason is bad. He says that we need to start just accommodating the things that aren't just reason and things like that are irrational. So if we could start uh, accepting your abstract art, your hippies, maybe not the person who took a shit on the stage. <laughs> yeah, um, just to... I won't put that in that category. We won't go that far. Beat novels and well, maybe... clearly society has accepted it. If people yeah. went and saw that show. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's just a bizarre... There's a rational reason for seeing it, just for the bizarreness <laughs> factor. But uh, if we accept all these parts, we might be able to save ourselves from the, the dullness of all the mental structures that have been inherited over the generations. Paradoxically, accepting the unreasonable can provide a lifeblood to a culture based on reason. Mm-hmm.